In this video, I'll discuss what I think is a common error that people make when thinking about happiness versus suffering trade-offs. And most of what I say here is inspired by the negative utilitarianism fact, especially the section on Buddhist axiology. So an illustration of this comes from a recent piece by Yu Kuang Eng for the journal Animal Sentience, in which he replies to various commentaries on an article that he wrote. In one section of the piece, Eng is replying to Stephen Harnad, who claims that there's a fundamental incommensurability between pain and pleasure. And Eng replies by saying that um, both utilitarianism and common sense recognize that pain and pleasure can be traded off. He says, even a mouse has the common sense of trading off pain and pleasure, as when it decides to cross a strip of painful electric shock to obtain the pleasure of electric stimulation of the pleasure center of its brain. David Pierce has a video of a rat crossing an electrified grid in order to wirehead itself. Um, so one complaint could be, as Pierce notes in, in this piece, the prospect of uh, pressing a magic lever may heighten the desire for anticipated reward without necessarily increasing the pleasure of the reward itself. Others have also questioned whether wireheading actually produces pleasure or just a strong wanting for stimulation. That said, if we look at the article that Eng himself cited, it says that stimulation in man produces a subjective feeling of intense pleasure. This article about the effects of brain stimulation in humans suggested that stimulation could produce a variety of different effects, ranging from general pleasure and well-being to relief of anxiety or depression, or the person might also stimulate just for the sake of curiosity. But regardless, let's assume for the sake of argument that wireheading does produce pleasure, and certainly other trade-offs that people make do produce pleasure and not just wanting for it. There's still an objection that we can make, which is highlighted in the NU fact. The objection says that in many cases, when it seems like we're making suffering happiness trades, what might actually be happening is that when we imagine the happiness that we could get by accepting some suffering, we start to crave that happiness and we would feel bad if we didn't get that happiness. So then if we don't make the trade off to accept some suffering for greater happiness, we might feel bad about it and might feel bad that we are craving the happiness. And so we might actually feel more suffering by not accepting the trade-off anymore. So what seemed to be just accepting suffering for greater happiness could actually be a choice between two different amounts of suffering. A similar thing can be going on with the rat that craves um, brain stimulation. Basically, once it's introduced to brain stimulation, it begins to crave that and is willing to endure suffering to get what it wants. And if it didn't endure the, the electric shock suffering, it would have the suffering of missing out on potential rewards. So I think it would be wrong to introduce a rat to brain stimulation because that only induces greater cravings in the rat and those cravings need to be fulfilled. So you're actually sort of adding a debt rather than adding something positive. You're basically just increasing the cravings that the organism has and then that requires more to be satisfied. This idea that when there are other options, we feel bad about what looks like a suboptimal option is sometimes called the paradox of choice, and it's discussed by psychologist Barry Schwartz in this video. The second effect is that even if we manage to overcome the paralysis and make a choice, we end up less satisfied with the result of the choice than we would be if we had fewer options to choose from. And there are several reasons for this. One of them is that with a lot of different salad dressings to choose from, if you buy one and it's not perfect, and you know what salad dressing is, it's easy to imagine that you could have made a different choice that would have been better. And what happens is this imagined alternative induces you to regret the decision you made, and this regret subtracts from the satisfaction you get out of the decision you made, even if it was a good decision. Schwartz has also said the secret to happiness is low expectations. And in general, there's a common idea that happiness is how good things actually turn out to be divided by how good you thought they would be. 
So this is consistent with the idea that happiness is about reducing cravings. So this relates to Buddhism's second noble truth. The second noble truth basically says that suffering is caused by cravings for something that you don't have, and the goal by implication is to eliminate cravings rather than to achieve pleasure so that you can have some sort of happiness that's better than the absence of cravings. Um, of course, Buddhism itself is very complicated, and there are many practitioners with different ideas about what it means. So what I'm saying here is sort of um, an outsider's simplification of the actual philosophy. We can apply this way of thinking to challenge several criticisms that people make of negative utilitarianism. For example, the claim that I'm glad that I exist and it would be sad if I hadn't existed. This again is a comparison between two alternatives, either non-existence or existence. And when you see both alternatives, you can feel sad to imagine not existing because the other one looks better to you. But if you hadn't existed at all, there would be no choice between them. There would be no being sad about not having existed. So um, there would be no craving for your, you to exist and hence nothing wrong with that situation of ignorance about the alternatives. Of course, this is just one possible way to assign moral value, and certainly it's not wrong to also assign positive value to existence over non-existence. But this Buddhist approach shows that there's a consistent way to um, yield negative utilitarian type conclusions without invoking some sort of weird asymmetry. In fact, it follows naturally from minimization of cravings. Returning to Eng's article, um, Harnad himself made this point that being deprived of pleasure may sometimes be painful, and Eng acknowledges that that's a relevant consideration. He then goes on to offer the following thought experiment. Imagine that in scenario one, you can have 100 units of pain plus one unit of pleasure, and in scenario two, you have 101 units of pain plus 10 trillion units of pleasure. And Eng says that this should include all effects, including the pain of deprivation from pleasure. So Eng believes that I and most people have no hesitation in choosing the second option. So it may be true that most people and animals would choose the second option here. But for one thing, I think we should be careful to keep in mind the pain of deprivation. So if an agent was presented with both of these options, then if the agent chose the first option, he or she would regret not getting the pleasure in the second option. So some fraction of this 100 units of pain is actually the pain of regret from not choosing the other option, rather than, say, physical pain or whatever is the direct cause of pain. So um, maybe there are only like 50 units of direct pain and then another 50 units of regret from not choosing option B. And even if um, we properly take that into account, there's still a choice that we can make about how we want to value things. So the Buddhist axiology here would say um, we should look at each option in from the inside perspective. And basically, if um, the person was only presented with option A and didn't know about option B, then there would be no nothing to regret about having missed out on the pleasure. Um, and so relative to just that option itself, there's nothing wrong with its choice. And if there's nothing wrong with its choice, then there's no reason to introduce the second option in order to cause the agent to crave something else. Um, there still is a problem with the direct pain that the agent experiences, but once that's over, there's nothing further wrong with that scenario. Also, this discussion can seem rather abstract where we're talking about units of pleasure and units of pain. And just from a very abstract perspective, it seems intuitive not to care that much and just say, yeah, more units of pleasure outweighs more units of pain and not really give much thought to it. But if we say make this concrete and say that you're in a brazen bull having your skin burned and these are seconds that you'll be in the brazen bull, from that perspective, it, it becomes a less trivial choice. and. Um, if we think about the person moment during the extra one second in the brazen bull under option B, that person moment, assuming the pain is so bad that it would give anything to stop, that person moment is um, 
not happy with the choice and will not be compensated by anything else that happens later on. And so from that person's per that person moment's perspective, option B is worse. And um, with option A, there's no one, uh, there's no extra person moment besides the the original 100 who are made worse by that choice. 